डिक्टेशन सिक्सटीन रेडी गुड एंड बैड एंड इवन द हायर गुड दैट मिस्टिसिज्म फाइंड्स एवरीवेयर आर द रिफ्लेक्शंस ऑफ आवर ओन इमोशंस ऑन अदर थिंग्स नॉट पार्ट ऑफ द सब्सटेंस ऑफ थिंग्स एज दे आर इन देम एंड देयर फोर एन इम्पार्शल कंटेम्पलेशन फ्रीड फ्रॉम ऑल प्री ऑक्यूपेशन विद सेल्फ विल नॉट जज थिंग्स गुड और बैड ऑल दो इट इज़ वेरी ईजिली कम्बाइंड विद दैट फीलिंग ऑफ यूनिवर्सल लव विच लीड्स द मिस्टिक टू से दैट द होल वर्ल्ड इज गुड द फिलोसफी ऑफ एवोल्यूशन थ्रू द नोशन ऑफ प्रोग्रेस इज बाउंड अप विद द एथिकल डुअलिज्म ऑफ द वर्ल्ड and the better and it is thus shut out not only from the kind of survey which disregards good and evil altogether from its view but also from the mystical belief in the goodness of everything in this way the distinction of good and evil like time becomes apparent in the philosophy and introduces into thought the restless selectiveness of action good and evil like time are it would seem not general or fundamental in the world of thought but late and highly specialized members of the intellectual hierarchy although as we saw mysticism can be interpreted so as to agree with the view that good and evil are not intellectually fundamental it must be admitted that here we are no longer in verbal agreement with most of the great philosophers and religious teachers of the past i believe however that the elimination of ethical considerations from philosophy is both scientifically necessary and though this may seem a paradox an ethical advance both these contentions must be briefly defended the hope of satisfaction to our more human desires the hope of demonstrating that the world has this or that desirable ethical characteristics is not one which so far as i can see a scientific philosophy can do anything whatever to satisfy the difference between a good world and a bad one is a difference in the particular characteristics of the particular things that exist in these worlds it is not a sufficiently abstract difference to come within the province of philosophy love and hate for example are ethical opposites but to philosophy they are closely analogous attitudes towards objects the general form and structure of those attitudes towards objects which constitute mental phenomena is a problem for philosophy but the difference between love and hate is not a difference of form or structure and therefore belongs rather to the special science of psychology than to philosophy thus the ethical interest which have often inspired philosophers must remain in the background some kind of ethical interest may inspire the whole study but none must obtrude in the detail or be expected in the special results which are sought if this view seems at first sight disappointing we may remind ourselves that a similar change has been found necessary in all the other sciences the physicist or chemist is not how required to prove the ethical importance of his ions or atoms the biologist is not expected to prove the utility of the plants or animals 
which he dissects. In pre-scientific ages, this was not the case. Astronomy, for example, was studied because men believed in astrology. It was thought that the movements of the planets had the most direct and important bearing upon the lives of human beings. Presumably, when this belief decayed and disinterested study of astronomy began, many who had found astrology absorbingly interesting decided that astronomy had too little human interest to be worth of study. Physics as it appears in Plato's, for example, is full of ethical notions. It is an essential part of its purpose to show that the earth is worthy of admiration. The modern physicist, on the contrary, though he has no wish to deny that the earth is admirable, is not concerned as physicist with its ethical aptitudes, he is merely concerned to find out facts, not to consider whether they are good or bad. In psychology, the scientific attitude is even more recent and more difficult than in the physical sciences. It is natural to consider that human nature is either good or bad. In psychology, the scientific attitude is even more recent and more difficult than in the physical sciences. It is natural to consider that human nature is either good or bad and to suppose that the difference between good and bad, so all important in practice, must be important in theory also. It is only during the last century that an ethically neutral psychology has grown up and here too ethical neutrality has been essential to scientific success. In philosophy, hitherto ethical neutrality has been seldom sought and hardly ever achieved. Men have remembered their wishes and have judged philosophies in relation to their wishes. Driven from the particular sciences, the belief that notions of good and evil must afford a key to the understanding of the world has sought a refuge in philosophy. But even from this last refuge, if philosophy is not to remain a set of pleasing dreams, this belief must be driven forth. It is a commonplace that happiness is not best achieved by those who seek it directly and it would seem that the same is true of the good in thought at any rate those who forget good and evil and seek only to know the facts are more likely to achieve good than those who view the world through the distorting medium of their own desires we are thus brought back to our seeming paradox that a philosophy which does not seek to impose upon the world its own conceptions of good and evil is not only more likely to achieve truth but it is also the outcome of a higher ethical standpoint than one which like evolutionism and most traditional systems is perpetually appraising the universe and seeking to find in it an embodiment of present ideals. In religion and in every deeply serious view of the world and of human destiny, there is an element of submission, a realization of the limits of human power, which is somewhat lacking in the modern world. With its quick material success and its insolent belief in the boundless possibilities of progress, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and there is danger lest through a too confident love of life, 
finished. 